Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am very pleased to welcome you to today's webinar on the EPI macro model, a new SEI tool that allows planners to develop GDP baselines that take into account the economic repercussions of the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Charlotte Wagner, and I'm a scientist in the Energy Modeling Program at SEI, the program that is also home to LEAP, the Low Emissions Analysis Platform. I'm an environmental engineer by training with a background in environmental health, and I'm here today with my colleague, Eric Kemp Benedict, the director and senior economist of the Equitable Transitions Program. The tool that we're presenting today was developed by us with contributions from Anisha Nazareth and forms part of SEI's Integrated Climate and Development Initiative, an initiative that aims to support integrated climate mitigation and sustainable development planning with new tools and stakeholder capacity building. The work that we're presenting was funded by the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, CEDA. So today's agenda will begin with an overview, a presentation overview of the tool itself. Um, we'll provide general overview um, and then some more specific details on the macroeconomic and the epidemic component of the EPI micro model. We will also do a demonstration of the tool where we'll show how um, to run the tool in the most simplest fashion. There are a couple of different ways to run the tool and we'll go through one of them and show you some of the results that you would be expecting if you run the default setup of the tool. And then at the end, there'll be about 20 minutes for questions and other wider discussions. So, the COVID pandemic. For the past two years, all of us experienced various limitations um, in the ways that we've been going on about our daily lives COVID caused by the COVID pandemic. As cases have been rising and falling in the different regions of the world, we were forced to wear masks, um, introduce social distancing, maybe the um, schools of our children's were closed. Um, we had to reduce our social contacts, um, public health measures implemented to contain the spread of COVID also required us to work from home under more or less favorable conditions. But in addition to these personal consequences, um, the restrictions that were imposed to contain the spread of COVID um, had a severe impact on the economy in many countries. Maybe first, the economic sector first affected was tourism as international travel came to a halt. Many countries banned international travel entirely um, that had severe impacts on tourism around the world. As cases rose and um, many deaths occurred, uh, the healthcare sector um, suffered a major impact too as hospitals became um, overwhelmed. Of course, dining was very restricted, indoor dining in particular, really affecting the hospitality sector. Um, in many places, it was no longer possible to go out into restaurants, bars, um, clubs all became closed. And finally, maybe not quite as noticeable, but not any less important, um, these so, um, public health measures also had major effects on the manufacturing sector um, where supply chains were severely impacted, people couldn't come to work, um, special shifts were set up to keep people socially distanced. And all of this happened as a result of the public health measures that were implemented to contain the spread of COVID. And it showed in a real decline in GDP real growth, as you see in the graph in the middle here. GDP is an important input to many planning tools. So from a planning perspective, that is really important to account for. 
um, planning tools that use GDP as a major driver of many of the future projections include LEAP and WEEP, um, with many of which you might be familiar with. And having accurate GDP projections is important in order to inform the policy options that are available to us as we consider different sustainable planning trajectories. The economic impacts of COVID-19 were not uniform uh, around the world, though nearly all economies were affected. Here on the right, I'm showing real GDP growth in 2021. So following the major decline in GDP growth in 2020, and whereas some countries um, experienced quite strong recoveries with 6% growth or more, um, many places around the world did not recover um, that quickly. And um, you can also see this on the bottom time series graph, where really in 2020, the decline um, in GDP growth was much more severe in some countries than in others, and also the recovery um, was quite varied. Economic impacts of the public health measures implemented to contain the spread of COVID varied by sector, by economic sector, as I was outlining earlier, um, tourism, the hospitality sector, manufacturing, they all experienced different impacts and had different abilities to recover um, so far and are still experiencing um, a recession or an economic impact today, even though in some places um, life might be returning slowly back to normal. Um, Impacts also depend on the type of public health measures implemented. There were more um, dramatic um, public health measures that had a more abrupt and dramatic effect like the ban of international travel, whereas other um, public health measures um, affected um, the economy in different ways, such as maybe um, health or mask mandates. But what exactly are those short and medium term impacts of COVID-19 control measures on the economy? Was a question that came up over and over again and is one that is really important in order to um, carry out successful um, planning exercises. And so at SEI, we developed the new EPI macro model. EPI macro model stands for epidemic macroeconomic model. It's an open source software designed to help national and regional authorities generate their own COVID-19 pandemic adjusted economic baseline scenarios that incorporate those economic ramifications of the pandemic that were largely incurred through the implementation of public health measures. The EPI macro tool um, models COVID-19 disease spread as well as the policy response and public health measures, um, such public health measures that can be modeled in, in the EPI macro model include lockdowns, international travel restrictions, social distancing and others. And it simulates the impact on GDP and sectoral value added. It's intended to be used with tools such as LEAP or WEEP and other planning tools that use GDP or sectoral value added as an input. The model consists of two major components that allow us to integrate um, the COVID pandemic and its public health measures with the macroeconomy. The epidemic component simulates the community disease spread of COVID. It includes multiple variants, um, allows to simulate reinfections and the response of these to public health measures. Outputs from this component are infections as well as deaths from COVID-19. And then there is also a macroeconomic component, which consists, which simulates economic growth um, and the response of the economy to the public health measures implemented. As outputs, it generates sectoral value added as well as GDP. But how do we exactly connect the public health measures to the macroeconomic economy. 
Eric will tell us a little bit more about how the linkages between those two components work in the Epi macro model. I'll hand it you, over Cheryl. to you, Eric. Thanks very much. <clears throat> so as, as Charlotte was saying, there are these two components and they start uh, running in parallel. So you have public health measures, hospital occupancy that's simulated in the EPI model. And that impacts on domestic final demand, the public health measures, for example, uh, lockdowns affect uh, the hospitality sector, for example, as Charlotte was mentioning. Global GDP, on the other hand, which was also falling, affects demand for exports and potentially for tourism. Those are two major sources of demand. But there's another source of demand, which is for investment goods. And when the economy is in a recession, whether induced by the pandemic or for another reason, investment tends to drop off, which further lowers demand. So domestic final demand and demand for exports together uh, influence the volume of investment. If, if the economy is not growing, investment goes down and altogether those three sources of demand affect GDP. Can you go to the next slide, please? So why would you use it? So the idea is to allow planners to look at the economic impact of public health measures and to put these into planning exercises. So it's a, a perspective approach looking, looking to the future. We've tried to structure it so that the model can be adapted to national contexts. We've set it up by default with uh, urban and rural regions because the spread can be quite different in those two areas. Other differences can be large cities where there is a, an, an airport. So you have people coming from abroad versus um, other, uh, other parts of the country. And it's intended for data limited situations. So like LEAP and like WEEP, the structure can be adapted to the available data. And in many cases, uh, well, cases, case data is very limited. So we tried to structure it so that mortality data uh, could be used to calibrate the model. It is freely available, uh, not just free to download, but the code, you can take it, you can modify it. Um, and we are able through SEI's Integrated Climate and Development Initiative to provide technical support if you wish. Uh, and you can contact Charlotte or myself. Next slide, please. So I'll just say briefly about the macroeconomic component, what's behind it. It is based on an input output model. So input output data tracks expenditure uh, by one economic sector for goods and services provided by another economic sector. And so input output tables represent interdependencies between different sectors of a national economy. And input output data or the equivalent, a social accounting matrix or supply use tables are becoming increasingly available. Uh, for a wide range of countries. If you don't find input output data, you might find the country under uh, a social accounting matrix or, or a, a supply use table. The model reflects the sensitivity of economic sectors. And so this is why it has to be a sectoral model to public health measures. I wanna emphasize that it does not include the impacts of a stimulus. So the idea is that the model gives a kind of a, a, a floor of what is happening from the response to these public health measures, you can then alter the values coming out if you know that there is going to be a stimulus. I'll say something, we'll show a concrete example of that later. So the inputs are a sectoral input output matrix and then through a, a text file, you can say how to aggregate 
to sectors that are affected by public health measures. For example, you might combine retail trade and arts and entertainment, which are two standard sectors in an input output table to make your own sector public facing, a public facing sector that would be impacted by lockdowns or social distancing. You can specify the timing and extent of public health measures and provide economy specific parameters. Typically in LEAP or WEEP, you would just say what the economic growth rate is. So here that becomes a target growth rate and the model simulates departures from it. Some parameters and assumptions that link these, the sensitivity of final demand for sector output to public health measures, global GDP trajectory and the sensitivity of export demand to global GDP. And then it provides GDP and sectoral value added uh, both on an annual time, uh, time step and also by the user specified time step that was used in the simulation. And now I will hand back to you, Charlotte. And I will talk a little bit about the epidemic component of the model. The model handles COVID community spread through a pretty standard susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered model, which is often known as SEIR model. Such a conventional SEIR model has been adapted to handle multiple variants, waning immunity and reinfections, as we have seen um, to be important for COVID spread. And the way that an SEIR model works is that essentially the population in question, the study population, passes through different stages of the disease um, through time. Initially, one could, for example, um, consider that the entire population is potentially susceptible as um, the population or parts of the population become into, come into contact with infected individuals, they become exposed and eventually start becoming symptomatic and contagious. So passing into the infected pool here on the right. Um, once they um, have passed through the infection, they become recovered or vaccinated or may die depending um, on their prior health status and other um, um, preconditions. And because COVID, um, individuals can be infected with COVID multiple times, their model also allows for the possibility that recovered or vaccinated individuals, those would be in the model, individuals that pass directly from the susceptible pool into this recovered pool, um, can become reinfected over time. All of this um, is um, simulated for multiple variants, as we have seen. Um, the possibility or the risk of becoming reinfected increases with time as immunity from prior infection or vaccination wanes. Um, and so reinfections occur, though at much lower level than initial infections. The extended SEIR model um, that is part of the EPI macro model simulates the population spread of COVID while considering increases in mortality due to hospital overflow also. Um, the default version includes a baseline um, variant that resembles the variant that was present in the population for most of 2021. Um, as well as the Delta variant and that became dominant in later, um, the later parts of 2021. Um, it considers waning immunity, post-vaccination and infection and subsequent reinfections, as I just mentioned before. There are a number of inputs required in order to run the epidemic model component such as global infection rates for each variant. The model comes already set up with these for and the baseline and the Delta variants. It also requires information on the national population and geographic structure, as Eric was uh, mentioning, the default model is set up to simulate urban and rural populations that may vary quite significantly in how they um, experience the spread of COVID. And so you would have to represent the structure 
in the model in order to run it for your study area. Um, now the inputs are international and between region mobility that influence how COVID spreads um, at the study level, as well as the number of hospital beds per capita that available and that are available in the normal hospital occupancy in order to simulate hospital overflow. Um, it also requires starting dates for the introduction of variants, um, as well as um, the public health measures that were implemented in the study area. And a number of these inputs can be either set um, or be based on data, but they can also be calibrated. In particular, the public health measures um, might need to be calibrated um, because it, the model requires both the deployment schedule as well as the efficacy. So certain public health measures may be implemented at different times. That is what I mean when I refer to the deployment schedule. There may be overlapping and um, each of those public health measures also may have a different efficacy in containing the spread of COVID. A final input is a time series of vaccinations. If that is applicable, it's not required to have vaccinations for every single time point that you're simulating, but for specific points and times, the model then interpolates between these. Outputs of the model um, are the daily number of susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered or vaccinated individuals, as well as deaths. So you receive a time series of those data. We will look at that in just um, a minute as we go through the demo. And it also um, has as an output a time series of hospital occupancy, which is an important input to the macroeconomic component. And that concludes um, kind of the presentation part of, of today's um, de webinar. So I just wanna pause here and see whether there were any questions in the chat or um, whether people have any thoughts um, that they would like to share at this point. Um, and we can we could answer those, some of those here. And otherwise I would move on um, to demo how you actually use this model and how it's distributed and tell you a little bit more about that in order to set you up to actually use it. So I see no chat or Q&A or hands. You can do any of the three. And there will also be an opportunity again um, after the demo to ask more questions if you'd like then. So if there are no questions right now, I'll go to the next part of today's webinar. So we want to show you how to set up, run, and evaluate the EpiMacro model. Um, you, during this demo, we will show you how to download the files and set up the folder structure that is required in order to run the model, how to actually execute the model. And then we'll be looking at some results, some of which we've already hinted at now. The model, um, or the case study that the model is set up to run as a default is loosely based on the US. Um, that means that its economic structure um, or input output matrix is based on the US economic structure, um, as well as the geographic structure that the model is set up to run, including the regional disaggregation and international and between region mobility. Also, um, information on the hospital system is set up um, to represent the US system. And the model includes a baseline and a delta variant um, as they spread, as those were the two variants that were dominant between March 2020 and November 2021 in the US. Um, but it could be easily set up to run with an Omicron variant too, which is the one that is currently dominant. Um, and then we've set up the model to include a number of different public health measures, including travel bans, social distancing, mask wearing. Um, all of those were the ones that were present um, in the US over this time frame, but they are just an illustration of the types of public health measures that you could set up 
in the model if you were to use it for your own study region. It also includes vaccinations as they were um, disseminated over the past year. In the US, um, vaccinations can be turned off if that is not something that is relevant to your study region, um, but it has been included in this case study for illustration. The model is distributed both as a raw Python code and a Windows executable, um, depending on what you feel most comfortable with. You can run the model with either one. Um, for the Windows executable, it means that you're only modifying input files, whereas when you're working with the raw Python code, you can modify the model itself too. The model is freely available on its GitHub page, which is this link, and I will just show you what that page looks like. When you click on this link, you will end up on this page. It will it shows a list of all the files that come with the Epi Macro model here. It also includes a readme um, containing a short description of what the model does, as well as a number of documentation files. And here on the right, um, it includes several releases, one of which the latest one at which we will look at. So for the list of files that the model comes with, I just want to provide you a short overview of how they um, work together. There are a number of input files that the user can easily modify in order to represent the specific study region. These include um, these .yaml files that are pretty much simply text files that you can just open and edit. They relate to the public health measures that are implemented in the model, global trends, including GDP and COVID spread, epidemiological parameters and data contained in, S in the file called SEIR underscore params. That one you would only have to modify if you were intent on also including an Omicron variant if you would like to purely focus on the first two variants, then you wouldn't have to edit this. And then finally, files relating to the macroeconomic parameters and data. All of, all of these are fed into the backbone of the model, which consists of the epidemic submodel and the macroeconomic submodel that we just discussed. Um, these then use these input parameters um, to simulate the spread of COVID and its impact on the economy and produce a number of output files um, that we will look at as well. So let me show you how you would set up the model. So for simplicity, if you click on the release here on the right, so this is the latest rece release version 1.2, it provides a short overview of what was updated more recently, as well as some short instructions of how you can set up and run this model most easily. This is what we will be doing today. So this, um, the easiest way to run this model requires you to download the EpiMicro model executable and the input files zip folder. You don't have to unzip the input file zip folder to a location where you have read, write, and execute permissions. Um, and you need to place the EpiMicro model inside the folder so that the same folder at the same level of the folder structure. And then you simply have to click on the executable to run it. So this all sounds easy. So we're just going to do it. Um, I've already prepared, I've already downloaded the input files as well as the executable and unzip them and put them into a folder location. So this is a folder that I have in my document structure called SEI Epi Macro Model. It contains the input files that were contained in the input files zip folder, as well as the executable. In order to now run the model, you simply click on the executable. which will open a command prompt window. 
And then the model starts reading in all the input files. So just gonna show this in parallel again. There is the common params file, which contains um, global trends, the IO config files, which contains a lot of the epi macro data inputs, a regions file, which contains data on the population and the na uh, national regional disaggregation, and the SEIR params file, which contains data on the epidemiology. Um, it also contains the CSV file, which contains the input output metrics. All of these are read in, it then runs the epidemiological model, as you can see here, and the macroeconomic model component, and finishes. So the entire process takes about a minute on this machine. Um, it might run slightly longer or slightly slower on your machine, but it should complete pretty quickly. Once the model is, has run, um, it produces a number of Excel output files. Um, the first four files that you can see here are output files from the epidemic model component. And then the last two files are output files from the macroeconomic component. The um, epidemic component produces um, a file set dependent on how many variants you've set up and how many regions your model runs. So in this case, we have other provinces, which are the rural provinces and ports of entry, which are the urban regions, as well as one file for each of the variants that, that we're running. So there's a baseline variant and a Delta variant file. And then the um, macroeconomic outputs are value added at an annual and at a more detailed user um, defined time step, which in this case is monthly. So let me just open one of the epidemic um, file outputs. So as I described earlier, but I want you to be able to see these provide time series for each of the pools. So these are number of in the susceptible individuals, exposed, infected, recovered, um, died, and then the second round of infections. Um, for each of those, um, it gives you a number of individuals that are contained in these pools at any given time. So the model runs a daily time step. It starts on the 1st of January in 2020, which is the assumed starting date of um, COVID spread in the US in this model, um, and then runs all the way to 2024. For the macroeconomic component, let me just open you one of these files too, and we'll look at what the exact outputs look like on a graph in just a second. So here we see the sectoral value added from 2015 to 2023. And um, values are given for each sector and then also overall GDP. And if I may add, that column called coverage is the, the time coverage. So for example, in 2015, very few, very few, uh, days were included in 2015, only 2% of the entire year. So um, the where it says coverage one uh, or coverage 0.98, th those values represent nearly the entire year when doing the annual aggregation of the detailed data. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So let us look at what these um, file outputs actually look like when you look at them in a graph. So an important step in evaluating whether the model um, was actually able to represent COVID spread in the US was to compare it to US mortality rates. So here I'm showing a time series from March 2020, which is when the first cases were um, diagnosed in the US through November 21, so late last year. Um, in green, this kind of more jaunted graph is the US data. We chose to represent a seven-day average, but just because it's a little bit more robust and less susceptible to 
recording bias. Um, and these are, this is mortality, mortality rate. So deaths per 100,000 of population. And you can see that the model is quite nicely able to simulate the ups and downs that we saw in mortality throughout the pandemic, including the much higher um, mortality rates that occurred during the height um, of the baseline variant in the winter of 2021, 20, um, um, as well as kind of the summer lows. You see those in several years. So we were quite happy with this, with this result. And then we also ran the model out to 2023. And you can see that there are kind of um, ups and lows in mortality rate that continue out to 2023 when um, mortality rates start to decline um, and stay low. Of course, the mortality rates that we're seeing this spring, so here we're in March 2022, um, are much higher than they have been in the past, but they're not quite as high as is currently being recorded um, because this model does not include the Omicron variant. Um, however, as I said before, this could easily be included um, if you are interested in um, running this model and in including current data, then um, an additional variant could be set up um, and we would have some support available to, to support you in doing that. Eric's going to tell us a little bit about how the output from the economic component um, looks and how that compares to, to data. Eric. Yes. So um, the the U.S. had been growing at about two and a half percent per year, and so I supposed, all right, so perhaps a LEAP study in the absence of COVID might assume that that would continue. Um, these sectors represented here are aggregate sectors, um, ones particularly impacted directly include public facing, um, and also what I've called social support, where actually the demand for social support may increase, um, then that indirectly impacts industry and construction. Construction is important for investment. And so you get, you get an impact there. Um, there is also the sectors providing necessities, um, what were called essential work. Um, which were assumed to uh, not be uh, as impacted. And then other is also indirectly impacted through the input output matrix. So here we see um, in that first year, uh, the model does represent that drop uh, as recorded in 2020. But as I mentioned before, the model does not include a, a, the model in its current form does not include a possible stimulus. And there was a large economic stimulus introduced um, in, in uh, 2021. And so what you can do with this, um, with this tool is to say, okay, the tool is giving you a floor. Um, and, and then you can think about, all right, what does it and does not does it not include, and what might be the impact of the stimulus? And so you can modify your trajectory if you wish. If it's not really possible to do a stimulus and you're considering continuing to see the impact, then perhaps you you adopt the model values directly. So as as always, when thinking about economic impacts to a planning model, think about what the what the source of those assumptions are based on. Uh, the typical assumption is of steady growth. And so that assumes nothing, no disruptions. Um, this model allows for a specific disruption a pandemic. Um, and then you might want to further modify it based on additional policies or processes uh, going on. 
back to you, Charlotte. So this has given you kind of a taste of what the model can do, both in terms of its epidemiologic or epidemic, as well as its microeconomic capacity. But of course, you might want to go back um, at learning about this model after this webinar. So we've made available a number of documentations um, that can be found all on the GitHub page that I pointed to you earlier to. The GitHub page includes a readme here that describes the model. I already pointed you to this, but in the bottom of this readme, you can also find links to several more extensive documentation files. There is a link to the manual, which includes more detailed instructions on how to run the model than we've given you today, including how to run the Python version from the command line. It also includes more detailed descriptions of all the different input files and how they can modify, be modified and what they do in the model. So please do reference the manual if you have questions about the model setup. And then there is also technical documentation linked in this readme that provides um, the mathematical underpinnings of the model, both the epidemic as well as the macroeconomic component and more detailed descriptions on how the individual parts of the actual model, um, the actual Python model itself run. And so please um, look at these two if you have any questions about the model. Of course, if these, um, th this documentation doesn't answer your questions, you're most welcome um, to contact either myself or Eric um as well our emails are linked here um, and we'll be happy to answer any questions about the model so in summary SEI's new EpiMacro model is a software tool that allows planners to analyze the impacts of the pandemic on the economic baseline particularly gdp and sectoral value added and allows planners to generate climate and energy planning scenarios that account for the economic ramifications of the COVID-19 pandemic. In principle, this model can be adapted to simulate any other contagious disease too, but it is set up to run um, the COVID pandemic, including two variants. It can be adapted to national circumstances and resolve regional variation, which allows it to actually focus at specific study regions of your interest and explore the questions or the potential public health measures that have been implemented or might be implemented in the future. It um, spreads it models the spread of a contagious disease like COVID-19, including multiple strains and waning immunity, and allows you to explore, um, for example, lockdown, social distancing, testing and tracing programs and travel restrictions as examples of those public health measures that um, might have been or might be implemented in the future in order to contain the spread of COVID. It's intended for the use with tools such as Leap and Weep, or other planning tools that use GDP or sectoral value added as impact as um, inputs and is set up to work in data sparse environments where you might not necessarily have specific data on case loads um, through time, but only requires um, mortality data in order to be calibrated. And with that, we are happy to answer any questions and open the floor for a more general discussion. The recording of this session will be made available on SEI's API Macro Tool page, um, which the link you can see here on the slide at the bottom. Um, it should be made available within the next few days or so. Um, so please check there again if you're interested in re-listening to this recording. Um, and with that, I um, would like to thank 
everyone for their participation and presence today and I'm happy to answer any questions um, pertaining to, to the model or its application. Thank you. Well, Charlotte, we do have two questions and I've indicated that I would like to answer them live. Um, the first one from Jason Vesey is about uh, the GDP projections. So most leap models are indeed long-term and this one is an, a medium-term model. Uh, Charlotte, can you go back up to the slide that had the GDP Absolutely. Projections. Thank you. So um, the question is how to match up with a longer term trajectory. So in the longer term, I mean, the, the, the model assumes that you have a specific target here, two and a half percent per year. But in leap or weep, over the longer run, you would expect that to change. It might slow or accelerate depending on your scenario. But you can see that the general trend here is for a departure and then a return close to the trend. You could extend this a bit and you would see actually that in this model um, uh, that it will approach but never quite reach the original uh, line. Um, but regardless, what you can do is you can have an approach back to your original trajectory. Even if it never gets to the actual line, the growth rate will approach your original trajectory once the disruption of the pandemic has, has, uh, is, is in the past. So the way that you would do it is to is to keep your original long run projection, take this departure into account, and then at the rate suggested by the model, gradually approach your uh, original long run trajectory. Um, I hope that that was clear. And I'll look if there's a comment in the chat to say, no, it was not, or a hand. Yeah, there is not so far, but we'll, not have so happy far. To, we'll be happy to circle back to this if, if there is any follow-up question on that. The second question that we had in the chat was, what would be the limitations of the model and the error percentage of the output when tested against the real case? And I think that question pertains both to the epidemic model component as well as the macroeconomic component. Eric, do you want to start answering this question for the macroeconomic component and then I'll circle back to talk a little bit about the epidemic component? Certainly. Um, so th that depends on how much data you have to calibrate against. Um, the parameters, so once you have calibrated the epidemic model, that gives you the timing and extent of uh, public health measures. To link that to the, the macro model, you specify the, the impact by sector and by public health measure. Um, if you don't have that much data, you have a fair number of parameters to adjust um, in order to uh, reproduce a particular trajectory. Um, and the, the problem is we're, we're looking at, um, at a, an historically unprecedented health event uh, with limited economic data so far. Um, but I would say that with plausible parameters for the macro model, you can reproduce the apparent impact on the economy. Um, 
this is, I, I do want to be very clear that, that this is, a, the, the entire purpose of the model is to generate trajectories for planning models. It is not a full economic, uh, it is not a full economic planning model. Um, but we did try to build a, a very thorough epidemic model that captures a lot of the complexities and realities and good practice in, in building epidemic models. Um, so it, I, I can answer more if you've got a follow-up question about the, about the, the economics, but, but the, the basic answer is we're data limited, but it seems to perform reasonably well given the available data. But um, Charlotte, do you want to say about the, the epidemic model? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the epidemic model. So there is some calibration involved in setting up the epidemic model, in particular with regards to the deployment schedule and the efficacy of the public health measures. You may imagine that there are public health measures where it's very easy to translate them into a model environment that's maybe considered a travel restrictions. You have a specific starting date where no more international travelers or visitors are allowed in the country. There are, this uh, measure is controlled by officials at an airport. So in fact, no one is able to enter the country anymore or entry has, is extremely limited. And so in this case, you have a clear deployment schedule. You know when the start date of this public health measure came into force, when it ends, and how effective it was maybe even close to 100%. In other cases, that interpretation is more vague. For example, with a mask wearing mandate, you could imagine that in when a, public health measures like this are announced by officials. It takes some time until they're implemented in the population, different parts of the population may be more or less ready to actually abide by mask wearing mandates. Um, mask wearing is often only required in public. So in private settings, um, people would still come in contact with each other. So the efficacy is much lower. It may vary. Um, the time that it takes to ramp up a public health measure like this is more difficult to determine. And so in these cases, you can use the mortality data. Um, so the effective, that is essentially a proxy for the effective um, spread of COVID in the community to calibrate when exactly a certain public health measure came online and how effective it was. So this is what we did here. Um, this represents, I believe, five or six public health measures um, overall that were effective in the US over this time. But you can also see that the model does really well at um, showing these um, increases in dips. And so you can see roughly what the uncertainty um, in, in this model is. There, there is certainly some uncertainty um, that is, I think, inherent to any um, SEIR model. I imagine that people remember from the beginnings of the pandemics, and I mean, to this day, there is a high uncertainty on um, what the caseload, the actual caseload in the population is. Um, mortality is maybe the best data point um, because registries um, on mortality are maybe most rigorously um, accounted for. So we actually do know often what excess death rates in the population were. Um, and so you can you can use those. But you, I mean, it's easier to calibrate a model like this if you have a larger set of historic data, which is, I think, what um, Eric alluded to for the macroeconomic component too. And if you're not trying to project out too far into the future, if new, um, new variants come online that have a widely different behavior or are much more contagious, um, then that obviously would it changes this trajectory um, substantially. So um, there is um, some educated, um, like an educated guess or an evaluation required in order to ensure that the model behaves appropriately. But it's very easy to set up and the data that you get out of the model is very clear. And so mortality data is one way to assess the performance of your model. So, I I will just 
answer, I realized we there was another part of the question about limitations of the model. And for that, it might be helpful to compare to some others. So I'll just say something very quickly about that since we're at time. Um, there are some epidemic models that are highly spatially disaggregated and detailed. Um, this one, but but many of the ones that are used for policy guidance and planning are of this SEIR type. We tried to strike a bit of a balance because clearly some, some spatial dynamics are important, but the spatially disaggregated data aren't, aren't readily available. And so we tried to allow for some, uh, some regional disaggregation without without placing undue uh, data requirements. For the economic model, there are both supply constraints arising from the pandemic and demand constraints. The supply constraints was from, uh, was from workers not going to work and supply chain disruptions. This model focuses on the demand side. It's very, strongly focused on the demand side because that seemed to be driving a great deal of the of the fall in in um, in economic activity um, in in many countries uh, so that's that's a particular choice for this for this model is to focus on that another is that um, the the investment that is calculated in this model basically it assumes like like as for many of the of the GDP assumptions that you might put into leap or weep you assume that things go pretty smoothly and so this one assumes that aside from the pandemic things go pretty smoothly so the investment demand that is calculated is the investment demand that would be required to meet your anticipated uh, the, to meet the what the model says the demand will be under the impacts of the of the pandemic. Um, what that means is you you don't end up with with the kind of swings up and down that you get because of uncertainty about how much to invest, which happens in real life and in real economies. Those kinds of swings, uncertainty in how much to invest are normally set aside when making GDP projections in leap and weep, which are typically pretty smooth. So this model, you could view it as a limitation, but I would say it's trying to stick to the spirit of what is normally done when choosing a GDP trajectory for a planning model like this. That was a bit technical. I'd be happy to go into it further if you wish. <laughs> you have our contact information, but that's that's what I would say. And if you have any further follow up questions now, you can put them in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, and I just wanted to put up our email addresses again for this purpose. We are um, five minutes past the hour, so um, I want to close this meeting and give everyone an opportunity um, to leave. I'm sure you have busy mornings, afternoons ahead of you or evening plans. Um, we are happy to stick around for another 10 minutes or so um, and answer any other questions that may um, pop up. So if you do have more questions, please just stay online and we'll be happy to answer more. Um, in any case, um, our emails are shown here. You can also find them on the SEI website um, or on the GitHub page, um, and we'll be happy to answer any follow-up questions that way. Um, the recording, as I said earlier, will be made available on the SEI Epi Macro tool page, which you can find on the SEI page. You can simply Google it, and it will pop up. Um, so that will be made available there. Um, it might also be made available in other places. I just want to mention one more thing, which is that we're considering to um, start an interest group around the EpiMacro model on the LEAP page. So if you are interested um, in, in developing um, a study exercise using this model, that might be a place for further discussion too. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And with that, I would just like to thank everyone 
again for their participation and for coming in today and listening um, to us talk about this new tool. I hope um, you found it interesting and learned something new and that um, you might be able to use it. And in any case, if you do have any questions as you may be experimenting with the tool on your own, um, if you have any problems setting it up um, and the documentation doesn't answer your questions, we are here um, to answer questions related to the Appia Macro model. Thank you very much. <laughs>